Welcome, friends. We have gathered today to celebrate the life of Ruth Kelly. She, in, in her passing, we experience grief. But also in her passing, we experience celebration and life. In Christ dying, he destroys our death. In Christ rising from the dead, he restores our life. <clears throat> Jesus, the Christ, will come again in glory. In her baptism, Ruth put on Christ. And so now in Christ, she is clothed with glory. Here and now, my dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed to us, but we know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, and we shall see him as he truly is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ himself is pure. Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life, and those who believe in him, even though they die, they live. Whoever lives and believes in Jesus the Christ will never die. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He died so that we may live forevermore. He holds the keys of hell and death, and he lives, so also will we. Friends, we have gathered here, first and foremost, to praise God, but to witness to our faith and to celebrate Ruth's life. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. But in this, we ask that God grant us grace, that in our pain we will find comfort, in our sorrow we will find hope, and in the death we will find resurrection. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. But we especially praise you for Ruth, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these grant your grace, let perpetual light shine upon them, and help us so to believe where we have not yet seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with human hands, but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together, Blessed Assurance. <laughs> Thank you. 
thanks and how humbled I am and honored that uh, the Kelly family would ask me to come today and, and how blessed I am that my buddy Roy Ice uh, is, has sort of prepared the way here and, and I appreciate your hospitality. Let's uh, take a look at some scriptures. Now, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation uh, just simply because I think it says it so well. Uh, the scriptures that, that we're going to read, we can look at them in one or two ways. Uh, they can be, and they are a comfort in times of grief, but they're also a celebration of a life that's prepared for this. And Ruth has been ill for so many years and, and infirm, and, and uh, she's been looking forward to this day. Uh, a great a theologian once told me that God heals us in a variety of ways. He may heal us directly, immediately, without any, any you know, anything being said. Or he may simply say, uh, see a doctor and take us to just the right one. And then he may simply say, as he said to Paul, uh, just hang in there. Hang in there. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be all right. Or he may say, as he's now said to Ruth, Ruth, you've had enough. Come on home. <laughs> and so there she is. Psalm 23 is, a, is just a perfect example of encouragement. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths. Bring honor to his name. Even when I walk in the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you, Lord, are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely, your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 121 is another one. I look up to the mountains, and I ask, does my help come from there? No, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber or sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. From Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 39. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory God will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been growing as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of that future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us the full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us 
with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with, with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So what shall we say? What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? or are threatened with death. As the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is, and the King James says, In my Father's house are many mansions. But oh, I like this. This is so hospitable. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. No. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. I'm telling you these things while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind, peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift to the world, a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and don't be afraid.
Some of you probably would have liked to have wrapped up in them because I heard some folks say it was chill. Ruth was a quilter, and she and my wife had a bond in things when that goes back. So my wife quilts, and Ruth obviously was, was quite a good quilter. As Dean said, when we would visit, he and I would talk, and Ruth and my wife would quilt. And that's kind of the way it is. But Ruth had, Ruth was, she was just a part of the whole that is Bethel United Methodist Church. I, when I first came uh, at early service, Ruth played, and I didn't know it, and, uh, but Ruth was a, a self-taught pianist. Oh, I think she had some lessons early on, but I, I gotta tell you, I had piano lessons from the time I was six until I was in high school, and then I had four years of piano classes in college, and I couldn't play as well as Ruth did. <laughs> Ruth was, was, a, was a great gal, and, and she just had a, a, a winning personality. She was just a person that would smile and make your day. She loved to sing, and during my tenure, here about every Christmas, we put together, I guess you call it a choir, I call it the Bethel Vocal Band. <laughs> and, uh, we, we would do a Christmas musical, and then every once in a while, I think we did two or three Easter musicals and, and a couple of patriotic musicals, and Ruth was right, she was right there. She wanted to be a part of that. And I, I saw pictures uh, of, of before my time, Ruth in, in, one of the, in the choir here, and, well, those days, uh, those were great days. And Ruth's Ruth smile and, and her place in that was, was a great part of it. She, she just, uh, just just made it. And just to come today and to celebrate. You know, so many times when we come on occasions like this where someone has been taken by death, we come and, 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 well, I know that there are tears today, and that's, that's normal, and that's who we are. We're human beings. But at the same time, there is this sense of joy and this sense of celebration because we know, we know that we're not here to lay someone to, to, to rest, and, and there is no hope. We know that Ruth had a relationship with Jesus Christ. We know that she did put on Jesus in her baptism. And we know that she was looking forward to the day that she would see him face to face. Oh, it was, it, it was, it was so neat seeing her and seeing her sing, seeing her play the piano, and seeing her in many other roles that she served in the church and in the community. It was just great. I came across a poem that I think just sort of summarizes this whole thing. And I'd like to close my part with this poem. I was seated one day at the piano. I was weary and ill at ease. My fingers wandered idly over the noisy keys. I, I don't know what I was playing or what I was dreaming then. But I struck one chord of music that sound with the sound like a great amen, with the sound of a great amen. It flooded the crimson twilight like the close of an angel's song. And it lay on my fevered spirit with a touch of infinite calm. It quieted pain and sorrow, like love overcoming strife. It seemed the harmonious echo from our discordant life. It linked all the perplexed meanings into one perfect peace and trembled away into silence as if it were loath to cease. Oh, I've sought 
but I seek it vainly. That one lost chord divine, which came from the soul of the piano and entered into mine. It may be that death's bright angel will speak that chord again. It may be that only in heaven I shall hear that great amen. It may be that death's bright angel will speak that chord again. It may be that only in heaven I shall hear that great amen. I want you to know something. That chord is sounding throughout heaven today. And Ruth is right in the middle of it. She's hearing it. She's rejoicing. She's praising God like she never praised him before. And she's got a smile bigger than anything she could ever have. Praise God for his same grace. Praise God for folks like Ruth. Would you stand again as we sing when we all get to heaven? That's when we get to hear the call. <laughs>
My parents, Roberta Field Seneff and Vance Seneff, moved to Louisville, Kentucky after they were married, and I grew up in the suburbs. That's what's often called the city boy. <laughs> you couldn't have convinced me that I was a city boy because about every other week, we would drive to Washington and I would work on my grandmother's farm. I say work, you know, what does a little boy know about working really? But she had me out at seven years old digging fence post holes, and when I wanted to quit, she said, the hole's not done, is it? <laughs> but we would gather eggs and feed the calves when she had some and look at the kittens and the puppies and that kind of thing. But part of our trips to Washington were seeing our family members. Well, Grandma was the oldest of 11, so there were a few family members in Washington. <laughs> It seemed like Christmas lasted forever. <laughs> Visiting family for over a week. <laughs> <laughs> lots of family, lots of love, lots of food, and a smile or laughing everywhere. Almost every year from the day I was born, we'd come up to the Lewis family reunion I think I've maybe missed six times in my whole life. And of course, family. Conservation Club, the City Park, Susan, Brandon, Brad, and, and Garrett's church lately. In short, I had a marvelous child. A, a whole lot of it was spent right here, singing in this church. Davies County, Washington, Montgomery, Odin, which is where my dad was from. In all of those scenes, I picture Ruth. Her sister Gail, Uncle Bob, Aunt Mary. Ruth and Gail were like big sisters to my little brother Stephen and me rolling down the hill in front of their house, <laughs> showing us how to work the water pump down at the bottom of the hill, saying, don't pinch your fingers. <laughs> Exploring the woods around the farm, just having lots of great time. But Ruth was 14 old, years older than me, so I feel like it was probably a little bit of a chore to watch two active little boys run around and keep them out of trouble. But she did, and so did Gail. They were like big sisters, playing music for us. We had a great time. As we got older, Ruth and Gail got married and left home. While we still enjoyed visiting the farm, it definitely wasn't the same without our playmates. We still saw Ruth on most visits to Washington and every year at the family reunion and often visited Ruth and Dean at their place. Dean would show us his latest bow, gun, or trophy. <laughs> and Ruth would cook her fabulous meals, entertain us, and tell us the latest family news. And she knew all of the news. <laughs> A trip to Washington didn't feel complete without visiting them and our other aunts and uncles and cousins. Our mother was a beautician. And I like to think that there might have been a little bit of inspiration for for Ruth there. But I know Ruth was a good beautician because my mom let her do her hair. <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally, I think, seem to remember when I was little, she might have trimmed my hair a couple of times too. When Susan and Sherry came along, my beautiful girlfriend Cheryl, and I helped to entertain them. <laughs> At the reunion, we would play with the girls, carry them around, involve them in the games that the cousin played, frisbee, football, and pushing them on the big swings at the conservation club. And boy, we did a lot of pushing. <laughs> I wouldn't trade those days. 
Always in the center of the hustle and bustle of preparing meals, Ruth was right there. Ruth Jane, as my mother called her. She would never say Ruth, or rarely, she would always say Ruth Jane, which she did in a lot of love. My mom always used her first and second name as far as I can remember. And Ruth made sure everybody was there. She knew when everybody was going to arrive. She made sure that the food was set out just right. And especially the grace was prayed over the food. As Stephen mentioned to me this morning, Ruth's constant presence, her encouragement, her graciousness, her love of family. both close and extended, was instilled in her daughters. And it was obvious to everyone who encountered her. She loved her family. You all know that. She was proud of her girls. She loved her husband. She loved her grandsons. There was always news about all of them when you talked to her. As our nearly 104-year-old aunt told me this morning on the phone, <laughs> two months, she told me, two months, I'll be 104. <laughs> Ruth was vivacious <laughs> and loving. She served her church and she served others. That's what Aunt Corinne said. <clears throat> The one thing that remained constant, excuse me, about visiting with Ruth is that in subtle ways she always made her faith known. Whether it was thanking God for her blessings, turning to him when things were a challenge, or lifting others up, Ruth was faithful. I promised Sherry I would make her laugh. <laughs> So that's what I intend to do. On the back of your bulletins, you're able to read a lot of things about Ruth and her life. And I'm here to help you read between the lines. <laughs> there were three of us who shared a long and sweet history together. We had a lot of precious moments. And the two remaining of us, Sue over here, and myself, were really friends before we even knew it. My birthday was in January, Sue was born in July, and Ruth was born in November. Well, our parents carried us into this place in our little pink blankets, and this is where we got to know one another and to love one another, and to know Jesus, and to love him. It was because we came to Sunday school, and Bible school, and MYF, and we were in the same um, confirmation class. We went to Rivervale to church camp together, and on Wednesdays, our parents would come here to a prayer meeting, and Ruth and I would sit right over there about the third row back and do our homework. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time together here in this building. Then we started first grade when we turned six. And we went 12 years to school together. All of our elementary classes or room ages were in one room buildings, one room school buildings. And then we started to high school. <coughs> And I can tell you that was a big culture shock <laughs> to us. <clears throat> so we, we spent 12 years together, graduated together. But I'm going to take you back just a little bit. The first night Ruth ever stayed away from home, she spent it at my house. And then we began to rotate trips back and forth. When she'd come to my house, we'd have popcorn and grape Kool-Aid. When we went to Ruth's, 
We had ice cream sodas with either red or orange pop. <laughs> and we'd take those out to Ruth's porch sling on her front porch, and her fuzzy dog, shepherd dog, Sandy, would either sit at our feet or on our feet. <laughs> now, I saw a picture back here of someone sledding on the Pennington <laughs> Hill over here. I remember those days. It was the perfect place. You said something about rolling down the hill. Well, I remember sledding down that hill. But one of the one of the memories I have probably wouldn't be as sweet to Ruth as it was funny to me. <laughs> I got a new pair of roller skates, and it was the kind you clip on to your shoes. That's been a while. Anyway, we took him to my basement, and from the steps to the support post was maybe six feet. Well, Ruth put on the skates, and it was four feet too far. <laughs> Needless to say, that did not end well. <laughs> So never again did she do that. And Ruth and I were Pat Boone fans. It was because Elvis was too scandalous for our Methodist <laughs> Ruth and Sue both played piano, as you've heard. I played radio. <laughs> Ruth loved to sing. I will confirm what you said about her loving to be in the programs, the cantatas that uh, Pastor Marvin had here. That was the highlight of Ruth's year. But we were also in 4-H together. Ruth, being the practical person that she is, took practical projects <laughs> in 4-H. She took um, sewing, cooking. Not me. I took forestry projects, made wildlife posters, and showed beef cattle. <laughs> Something that would sustain me through. <laughs> Sue had a happy medium. She learned to make cherry pies, but she also showed cattle. <laughs> and then after after that, we were in high school together. Again, Ruth, the practical person that she was, took business courses, and she took home economics. Not me. I took Latin, chemistry, advanced biology. So you can imagine how much good I've gotten out of those. <laughs> Well, after we graduated, I went to Indiana State to become a special ed teacher. I bet not many of you knew that, because I never made it. <laughs> Ruth did go to school to be a beautician, and she spent the next 50 years trying to make me look good. <laughs> with the three of us is that God put three wonderful young men in our lives. All three of us as couples pledged our vows right here in this church before God and his people. Now, this is kind of interesting because we know that Ruth and Dean next month would have celebrated 54 years. 54 years together. Now here's a statistic for you. Among the three couples collectively, we have been married 168 years. <laughs> Where did that time go? <laughs> Each of us then had two girls, but then Kyle came along and he, he ruined the equation. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> well, as adults, the three of us, again, did things 
together. We went to Bible study together. We were in UMW together. We were in April Devs together. And Ruth and I made the very first Southwest Indiana walk to Emmaus together. Well, I know there are a few of you thinking, I've left something out. <laughs> and I look on Susan's face. I know she knows what it is. <laughs> well, when Ruth and Sue and I were in the fifth grade, we, along with Carolyn White, decided we wanted to form a club. <coughs> a club. Well, we weren't going to have any dues, and there weren't any bylaws, and actually, we didn't really have any meetings. <coughs> we did elect officers. <laughs> but we brainstormed, because we weren't sure what to call this club. So we finally came up with the TKFEB club. You'll find a picture right over here that later. <coughs> Now, when we did that, we made a pact with one another that we would never tell anybody what the TKFEB stood for. Well, I can assure you, Ruth took that information with her last Thursday. <laughs> she never told you, did she? <laughs> and Sue and I have made the same vow, so you won't get that information from us. <laughs> but I have to think that at some point in time, the four of us will be sitting on the banks of the Jordan together, laughing hilariously about the years and the number of people that have tried to figure out <laughs> what a TKFEB <laughs> So, we can either be known as the Three Stooges, which we probably have been, or the Three Musketeers, because we have joined forces in prayer to defeat the enemy. And then I think finally, and most importantly, we'll always be the Three Amigos. <laughs> Because, as the song says, friends are friends forever if the Lord is the Lord of them. So that's what we will be. But I have one more thing. When I turned 16 and then Ruth, or Sue shortly thereafter, Ruth was envious of us because we got our driver's license first. And now I have to say that Sue and I are envious of Ruth because she got to see Jesus first. So, Ruth, ta-ta for now. We'll talk later. celebrations that don't involve food. <laughs> so as a part of our celebration downstairs, I happen to know there's some cooked pork and other goodies, and you're invited to come down and share more stories and more laughter and more love as you gather around the table together in fellowship and celebration of Ruth. Let's pray. 
Lord, we've commended into your hands your servant, Ruth. We acknowledge and we humbly pray that as she is a sheep of your own fold and a lamb of your own flock and a sinner of your own redeeming, the joy of your presence is with her. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the rest of the everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of life. And now, Lord, as we go to fellowship together, will you bless that time we have to share our stories and to laugh and to reacquaint ourselves with each other and just simply to rejoice. Bless the food that has been prepared. Bless it to our bodies that it might strengthen us in your service. We ask this, Lord, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand as we sing, I'll fly away. <laughs>